Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us and continuing coverage of the Kogi Biosphere election. Where else to be other than here, where we're giving you all the details that you need to know, especially when you are not able to see anything. If you are in Biosphere or Kogi, because it's late in the day now, but you will still have our eyes out there for you. Um, interesting scenario play. Yeah, now, some of the images that we've just shown now, uh, some of the uh, activities earlier in the day, mm. of course, uh, I mean, much it was, of it, it was in, in biosystem. Yeah. At the beginning, absolutely. Even though there, you know, there was a bit of um, uh, people were not happy that the uh, officials didn't come out on time mm -hmm. and they were there already. But eventually, you know, the process it's, it's went picked on. up, yeah, and picked we up. saw uh, the exercise take off very nicely. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, in some areas, uh, especially in some parts of Gogi, mm -hmm. uh, well, let's show you the some of. Uh, uh, the instance that this Uluofa yes, earlier this in, the, in the day, uh, Uluofa in uh, Kogi State. Them scampering for, for safety. I yeah. mean, these are people who were well, gunshot heard in the distance. And it's amazing yeah. because our correspondent said it was all going well. They were on the queue. All of a sudden, masked men appeared from nowhere. And yeah. you know, you begin to wonder with this heavy deployment, I continue to talk about it, Shim. 36, Over 36,000. 36, and you officers. wonder where they were when all these people showed up and then made away with all the, with all the um, you know, materials and everything. How did they get away from this kind of place with the heavy well, the fact that even the borders uh, through the States uh, are cordoned off, uh, 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 are blocked uh, for entrance and exits into the state. Uh, at 6 a.m., uh, there were no movement into the in and out of the state. So you wonder what is. And then later on, we began to see visuals of the of uh, security forces patrolling the streets. But this is afterwards. So you begin to wonder where was that patrol when this was happening. Aside the law fire, there is also incident in Nayetoro and uh, some parts of. Uh, uh, Lokoja in uh, Ajayi Crowder, some of the instances. That was that, a very big unit, uh, actually, Ajayi Crowder. We're, yeah. we're, we're happy. It's probably one of the biggest. Yeah. So, but I think we should go live to the field and hear from our, one of our correspondents in Kogi State, right. who has. Uh, That's uh, Kela Megua, that is. Kela Megua. We will get to Kela in a moment, but perhaps we should get our panelists on the show uh, introduced. We have from our Abuja studio. Of course, we'll be uh, hearing from him much more on what has happened today, how his men and his colleagues at uh, 
conducted themselves and what happened. We have the first PRO of Nigerian Police Force, uh, Mr. Frank Umba. He joins us from our Abuja studio. Also with him is the, the Chief Press Secretary to the INEC Chairman, Mr. Rotimi Oyekomi, and also a lawyer there and the Director of African Center for Parliamentary and Constitutional Studies, uh, Mr. Emmanuel Ayegbunam, thank you, gentlemen, for coming on tonight. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I think I'd like to start off with, um, with DCP Mba there, simply because I know it's a busy day for you and you probably have to rush off. So um, let me just put this one in. Um, yes, not everywhere was, was, was um, shall I say, violence-free. But I wanted to take a little bit of something that you had said you know, to us. And you said you did a detailed security threat analysis. And that analysis helped you to have an intelligence-driven deployment of all the forces and all the men. What went wrong today, Mr. Mba? What went wrong today, Mr. Mba? Okay, thank you for the privilege of being here. Um, yes, I, I stand by what I've said. We, we actually carried out a very detailed security threat analysis. And uh, it was on the basis of those threat analysis that we configured and keep reconfiguring our deployments. And um, what you see today is actually um, a, a result of so much hard work that men and women of the Nigerian police force and other security agencies are put in place. If we tell you the the level of threat that we detected when we carried out the threat analysis. And if we tell you the, 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 the amount of work that went into identifying, isolating, and neutralizing a lot of this threats before today, you, you, will, you will appreciate the enormity of the challenges and the, the enormity of the accomplishments of members of the security agencies. And so for, for, for me, um, the, the fact that there are a few incidents of some isolated cases of violence do not in any way distract from the, the, the heavy investment and the heavy, the, 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 the amount of work we've done. Uh, let, let, let's look at Kogi, for example. Kogi is a state with 21 local government areas, um, 239 wards, and a little over 2,500 uh, pulling units. If, as a result of the work we did in collaboration with INEC, in collaboration with uh, our brothers and sisters from other agencies, we're able to um, have out of the 200 and out of the um, 239 words, or out of the over 2,500 pulling units, we're able to secure 90% of them without incident. I, I, I think we, we have done substantially and significantly well. Okay, you Mr. Mba, I, I, I will come back to you on the, that. Because the, the brand my, my, of politics. I, I, yes, I will come back to you on it because my actual question um, around where I'm driving at is how they were able to breach and, you know, where the security forces you deployed were. Yes, you did deploy, but I will come back to you on that, Kogi, but we need to go live to our correspondent, um, Kayla Megwa. She's standing by there for us. So, Kayla, just tell us what's happening now, where you are, and, um, and how far you've gone with the process that you're monitoring. Kayla. Hi, okay, so it's been a very disappointing day for us here in uh, Kogi State. It started off, it started off really nicely. Uh, we were at the Crowther Grammar School, you know, it was very, well, the, the materials came in early, but the security uh, operatives didn't come in early, so it uh, delayed the deployment of materials. That was how it started, and we thought that was going to be a bigger problem because that would affect, you know, how the, uh, when the elections were supposed to end, we're supposed to end at two, we're thinking was there going to be an extension. So that was where we were uh, in the beginning. And then the 
election started, uh, of course, you know, four of us are here in in, uh, in Lokoja, in, in Kogi State. I was in Lokoja, and we decided, you know, we're going to go around the state to see how it's working out. In Lokoja, it seemed all nice in the morning. Uh, we took strolls around, went to polling units, saw people exercising their franchise, and we felt, okay, so maybe this was going to be a very good uh, outing. Not too long uh, into the afternoon. A uh, very disappointing situation happened, especially at the Crowther uh, Grammar School. We actually saw thugs coming in. They were shooting in the air. We had to take cover. You know, everyone scampered for safety. It was a very disappointing situation. A lot of cars, a lot of gunshots. Uh, I was hiding for about six minutes uh, before uh, we were able to come out uh, and see, assess the damage that had been done. And by the time we came out from hiding, we found out that a lot of the election materials, in fact, all of them were gone not a lot of them everything was taken away we even spoke to a few people whose phones were also taken uh, a few people who uh, were crying because their valuables had been stolen as well in the in the ruckus so that happened at the crowder uh, grammar school and while we're busy trying to recover from that we found out that it was happening in other places as well and of course um you know, Kogi State, you know, has been known to have violent elections here and there. Uh, we're hoping that this was going to be a different outing, to be honest, but it wasn't. It was a very disappointing uh, situation in many parts of the state. That's not to say it was everywhere. There were parts of the state where um, elections went on safely, and some people were actually even commending uh, everyone who's a stakeholder in this election process for making the elections a free, fair, and credible one in their, uh, in their respective areas. Uh, the violence hasn't ended, I can tell you that for, for sure. Our, our correspondent, uh, Pius, uh, Pius Angbo, had to turn back uh, the highway leading uh, from Lokoja to, um, to Ayangba, I think that's the name of that place, uh, but the highway leading from Lokoja to Ajokuta uh, and that whole area, he, was, uh, he had to turn back. A lot of cars had to turn back because there was a riot in those areas this evening. We have those visuals, though. You'll probably be seeing it uh, much later. Uh, people hiding in the bushes. Our correspondent actually had to hide in the bushes as well with security operatives, and, you know, it was... Uh, it was a very disappointing situation uh, this evening. So it hasn't ended, and we're, uh, everyone's on pins and needles right now. That's the mood in Kogi State. We're watching to see what's happening. Now, earlier today as well, when we came back uh, from the Crowther Grammar School, uh, civil society organizations had a lot to say about the situation. Uh, we're listening to uh, Yaga Africa. They were talking earlier about um, you know, how some observers were being harassed in some particular centers and how it wasn't free, fair, and credible. They were asking for cancellation of elections in places where these violent acts occurred. And I hear we have someone uh, from civil society who's going to be talking to us uh, shortly about what her experiences are, some things that she saw, and um, what, uh, you know, what they would be uh, asking for going forward. We have uh, Mrs. Idaya here uh, with us. Thank you so much for speaking with oh, us. Thank you very much. J just so you can talk to us a bit about uh, the situation today in Kogi State. I think the election started... Um, on a good note, but I think what this election has taught us again is that election is a stakeholder's affair. It's no longer about the early arrival or not of materials, but it's the level of violence orchestrated violence that has been witnessed in these elections. I think this is one of the um, I don't even know how to put it because I lack words myself as somebody who has been observing elections, not just in Nigeria, but on the continent. It's, it's very, very worrisome. It creates, it raises the question of what democracy really is exactly. Right now, there are ongoing violence. There has been harassment of observers. There has been destruction of electoral materials. There has been open shooting and cutting away of electoral materials in several polling units. It's, it's uncalled for, and I think it's the worst thing to happen, especially after the 2019 elections. Rather than raising the bar on what we witnessed in the 2019 elections, this election has further lowered the bar and is raising questions on the 20 years of democracy we are celebrating this year. Uh, your group, uh, just tell us about the experiences that your group had today, uh, observing the elections. I think it's been a mixed bag. In some places where we visited, we the, the Center for Democracy and Development, CDD. I think it's been a mixed bag. At the beginning of the process, we were at places that were peaceful. People turned out in large numbers to vote. There were electoral materials. In several of those places, at least by eight, nine, we could say over 50 percent 
of the polling units were actually opened. And, there were, uh, and just, to, uh, just to add the fact that there was a large turnout, which was exactly. different. Yeah. Very, very large turnout. Ghana, I was in Ghana, I was in Ajaokuta, I was in several places. Very huge turnout of people ready to vote. Even we saw, we had instances of men and women queuing separately in large numbers, old people as old as 80 years, ready to vote. But rather than allow the will of the people to actually prevail, we had some talks, political talks, randomly coming in glare daylight cutting away materials, shooting. In some instances, we even had people, forcing people to vote along a certain line. I think it's uncalled for. I think it's unexpected. And I think that it's not even allowing us to actually look at the process. It's already delegitimized the outcome of the elections. Let's talk a bit about some of the issues that were raised by some civil society organizations. Like I said earlier, um, Yaga Africa I held a press conference immediately after the situation, uh, the first wave of attacks. Uh, one of the questions that they brought up was the issue of vote buying. Could you talk to us about that? I think vote buying was rampant as that yesterday the CDD had already issued a statement talking about financial inducement of voters and even electoral officials. And this is what we saw. In fact, all across Lokoja there were vote buying. From yesterday Ankara rice, uh, money were being distributed and the price of a vote ranges from 500 naira to 6,000 naira in these elections because we had places in Olamaboro that they paid as much as 6,000 naira to buy a vote. In fact, I witnessed several instances of sign language. We even had instances of the police themselves watching while they sell the vote. The whole issue about EFCC, ICPC coming in to help and assist in reducing this obviously had no effect. That, that brings us to another issue that you just raised, which is the fact that most of these things were happening while security operatives were present. Did you witness that? The violence and of yes, course the vote yes, buying. Yes. The violence, the cutting away of, of electoral materials. We even had instances where the policemen themselves have, have to scamper for safety. So I think it's one that it's orchestrated. I'm very surprised that in many of the polling units I personally visited, I saw policemen within the precinct unharmed, but outside some of it, where we expect to have patrols of the over 35,000 police people who have been deployed with arms and ammunition trying to guard it, we've not seen it. We've seen videos which we are also trying to fact check at the CDD, if genuine or not, where they were cutting away materials and they had a full escort cover of, a special, of the special anti-terrorism squad also. I think it's quite worrisome. It only raises the question that election is not just about voters. It's not about the independent national electoral commission uh, co conducting an election. It has to do with the nature and character of the political parties themselves. The zero-sum game and the security agents. After the 2019 elections, we all called in all our preliminary statements, even before the election day itself, that we expect to see the security agencies raise the bar and not be involved the way they were in the 29th. We, we, do, we do have to let you go there now, but thank you so much, Ida, for speaking with us. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, so that's Ida that, uh, speaking on the situation here in Kogi State, and we're waiting to hear from INEC and other players as to what is the situation, what should be done going forward. Back to you. Probably would have loved to ask um, uh, Kela there uh, mm -hmm. what they are hearing from INEC, what the process is like with INEC, uh, whether or not they are able to conclude this exercise at some poly unit. Kela, if you're still with us, if you can give us a sense of what INEC is telling you, if you have made contact with them. Well, I think or, we lost Kela there. Uh, yeah. I, I, well, not lost in that sense, but uh, she's we'll, gone. we'll try and get her back yeah. so that she can act. Mm. The main thing we're actually looking at is how will that process conclude, conclude. and um, what the counting and all that is yeah. saying right because, now. Because, I mean, if it's in the, in, in the balance, there's, there's a whole lot of trouble uh, mm. looming in, the, in terms of conclusion of the exercise. I think he wanted the, the DSP in battle to, 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 to respond. Um, to uh, let, let me go back to our Buja studio with um, uh, the spokesperson of the Nigerian Police Force, DSP, uh, DCP, DCP, Frank Kumba. Uh, you, you've uh, put a lot of effort in these uh, day and night of interaction intelligence gathering and heavy deployments that you have had. In fact, you, you've been supported by um, other sister agencies 
in what you have done today, uh, a lot of efforts you're putting there. But with the outcome of today, it does not look like it's pockets of violence. It looks so much like spread of violence. Perhaps some will say, quote, bag of violence. Are you disappointed in the outcome? Let me, first of all, start by saying that this, the situation in Kogi has actually indeed been very challenging, more challenging than the situation in Bielsa. The truth, again, however, is the fact that we saw a great deal of this in the threat analysis we conducted earlier. And we actually took a lot of measured and strategic, measure, and strategic steps to actually isolate and neutralize some of these problems. However, when you are policing an environment where politi politicians play very desperate games, where politicians believe in winning at all costs, where politicians do not believe in the rule of law or in due process, constantly you will be swimming against the tide. And of course, you understand that as police officers, we can never behave like thugs. In as much as we are armed, we believe first and foremost that our weapons are given to us by the state to preserve our citizens. And so even when we are responding to incidents at the police stations, we are conscious of the fact that we need to exercise maximum restraint. We, must, we, we, we need to exercise a lot of due care and diligence to ensure that in trying to stop the talks, in trying to stop the lawbreakers, we do not bring the innocent into harm's way. We, the, the, the policemen who are in, in, in Bayelsa, as well as the policemen and other security agencies in Kogi, are armed. They've got weapons, they've got loads of tear gas, but they are conscious of the fact that they needed to protect the citizens. They needed to use those weapons within the ambit of the law and exercise due care and attention so that we don't hurt our own people, that we are paid, trained, and kitted to actually protect. So these are some of the restraints. But like I've said before, if you are policing an election and you are able to deliver significantly across the geographical area where those elections, where the election is taking place, you would have been considered to have done excellently well. Uh, but I admit the fact that there are indeed challenges in in Kogi. As a matter of fact, as I speak to you, uh, as at the last count, 22 persons have been arrested. A, a, a vehicle that was used by some of the talks to attempt to commit um, some violence in some areas were, was impounded. About seven different types of weapons recovered. And of course, we've also recovered um, a catch of life ammunition, both AK-47 life ammunition as well as uh, life cartridges for the, for the usual pump actions. Um, the persons that have been taken into, into custody are currently helping us in investigation, and we will continue to follow up on those cases. Okay, DC Pimba, I know, I know it's as though we're just coming to you alone. We will get to the, the role of INEC and our legal practitioner who is in the studio there. But I just want you to give us a bit of clarity on the death toll that we're hearing coming out of Kogi today. We understand that there were three deaths and um, our correspondent actually did escort um, some of the family members um, to the home of one of them. Uh, could you just give us some clarity on the death toll that we hear coming out of Kogi? The standard practice for law enforcement agents all over the world is that you don't speak about death toll until you have actually confirmed and reconfirmed. 
And so I won't be able to speak about their tool, unlike our colleagues in other professions who can actually speculate or estimate um, casualty figures by, by our own very calling and our professional uh, standards, we are not allowed to, to speculate on, on, on number of persons that died in an incident. So we will come back to you as soon as we can empirically uh, confirm the figures and e e if any, we will get back to you and uh, we will responsibly do so. Well, Mr. Omba, let, I'll still come back to you. Uh, apologies to our other guests. We'll, we'll come to you because we understand that Mr. Omba may leave at some point. But if you look at the deployments made by the Nigerian police, uh, about 36,000 36, police officers, uh, the, for, uh, the IG said, were deployed. And you look at the number of polling units in uh, Kogiste, for example, it's about 2,600. So it tells you that an average of 10 police officers are on the ground per polling unit. If you look at what has happened, the kind of ammunition that you said you have recovered, and considering also the policy that you made of how you shot the borders to the state at 6 a.m., where do you think that uh, these ammunitions were coming in? Are they already on the ground? Okay, let, let me first of all try to make some clarifications on the deployment figures that you issued out. Again, um, anybody can pick up his um, calculator and, and do these calculations and come up with the ratio that you've just dished out. But you, you should understand that this figure covers both the drivers, it covers the men in the signal department, it covers the engineers that are working around the clock to make sure that our signals don't go down during important national assignments and operations of this magnitude. It covers the marine engineers who are also taking care of the boats, like, like, like particularly in, in Bayosa and in some parts of the riverine areas in Kogi. It also covers the undercover operatives. It covers the, 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 the few operatives handling our, the, 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 um, our helicopters, the pilots, the engineers, and a whole lot of other persons, the persons in the control room, and a lot of other operatives that are not usually um, seen on the front line. So when we give our figures, I also want people to understand that it does not just represent the, 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 the persons that are detailed to monitor the police stations, the police centers, and the collection, uh, the collection centers alone. Uh, and so that's, that's what I... Having said that, um, the issue of illicit arms and ammunition, you, you, you understand we've spoken about this repeatedly. Um, so many... Subject matter experts have spoken about the p proliferation of um, light weapons, not just in Nigeria, but also across Africa and so many other developing countries. And so, in the build up to these elections, we did take initiatives to try to mop up some of these illicit weapons. But as hard as we might have tried, I do not believe that will be able to mop up every single illicit weapon within those areas where the elections um, are currently taking place. That full and stop uh, gives us uh, a very good opportunity to take a breather. Ms. Umba, we will come to you uh, in a moment. It does look like security takes our attention at this moment. It's very important. The conduct also takes our attention because we need to look at what INEC did right and perhaps what went wrong. We'll take a breather. Myself, uh, my colleague, Ijo Maonyato, still on the program. We'll be back with our, our panelists to discuss more on the program. Don't go away. We'll be right back. <laughs> 